human innovation is limitless. We've built everything from cities to satellites. We've mastered technology, created global trade, and become efficient farmers. With all these achievements, we believe we're superior to animals. But are we? The truth is, animals invented most things before humans did and have been using technology in their world for millions of years. It's not just man that wants a little piece of the world to call his own. Almost every animal on this planet wants a home and instinctively knows how to build it. Just like us, animals are busy creating little hideaways from the outside world. Every one of the technological principles that underpin human society has a parallel in the natural world. In nature, we find builders, engineers and even farmers. When it comes to innovation, animals did it first. It was around 100,000 years ago that we first learnt to construct simple shelters. Today we create homes with advanced building techniques and what we construct is limited only by our imagination. Over the last 40,000 years, we've used increasingly sophisticated tools to build a home. But just as man moved from caves to more complex architecture and ultimately city dwellings, animals too have evolved to become decorators, designers, bricklayers and even carpenters. The first stage of home building is to lay the foundations using raw materials. And it's not just man who craves a little piece of the world to call his own. Animal architects use the same building materials and techniques that man does. For 60 million years, birds have been collecting twigs and constructing nests in which to raise their young. But there's one bird that stands out as the master builder. The weaver bird exploits the most abundant material of the African savanna, grass. To make its nest, the male weaves long strips of grass into a ring and attaches them to twigs at both ends. The ring is then extended to create a spherical foundation. The bird uses the same knots as we do to tightly interweave the grass. The walls are made from long grass and the ceiling from shorter pieces. Either way, the bird is always weaving a curved surface. The result is a magnificent nest, suspended in mid-air to keep it cool and out of reach of predators. There's one animal that makes a home of grass in fields of wheat. The female European harvest mouse builds its nest by exploiting a particular characteristic of grass. Grasses have parallel veins in their leaves so they can be split along their length without killing the leaf. By shredding the grass while it's still attached to its stem, the mouse makes a nest that remains as green as the surrounding field and is perfectly camouflaged. The mouse pulls loops from one split leaf through loops in others to weave a tough living structure. It's similar to knitting and construction is easiest to follow when the action is speeded up. The bottom of the nest is pulled in position to make a secure floor. Then pieces of grass are woven into a circular ring that's gradually expanded to make a tightly woven basket.
when the wheat ripens and turns brown, the grass nest also changes colour. It's the perfect camouflage. While the harvest mouse exploits the fact that grass is so abundant, many insects use an even more abundant raw material. That's if they can resist eating it. Leaves make perfect homes, so some tiny caterpillars burrow and live inside them. One small but enterprising beetle creates a home for her offspring from a leaf that's still alive and growing on the tree. First, the female leaf-rolling weevil bites the leaf's central vein to make it easier to bend. Next, she painstakingly folds the leaf in half. Then she rolls it up from the bottom and bites a hole in it so she can deposit her egg. Now all the weevil has to do is roll up the rest of the leaf so as to fully encase the egg. As the roll gets bigger, the work gets harder. Just as humans like a waterproof home, so too does the leaf rolling weevil. The leaf is tightly folded up in what is an incredible example of insect origami. There's an Australian spider that also turns a leaf into a home, but this time with the help of silk. The leaf curling spider attaches a leaf to a silk thread and hauls it into the air. She places the leaf at the hub of her web and starts renovating. She attaches silk to the edges of the leaf by moving from side to side. As the silk dries, it shrinks, and so the leaf naturally curls into shape. The end result is a sturdy home and leaf curlers go in for a variety of architectural designs. We humans have found that it's quicker to build a home if we work as a team. But African weaver ants discovered this 150 million years ago, and they have the biggest chain gangs in the world. First, the female workers use teamwork to hold the edges of two leaves together. The leaves are much bigger than they are, so they form a chain gang to pull the leaves closer. Silk is used to attach the leaves together. The adults can't manufacture silk, but their larvae can. So these are recruited to provide the glue. While some ants continue to hold the leaves in place, others manipulate the larvae with their mouths until the silk attaches the leaves together. It's a slow process but eventually hundreds of leaves become attached to make a two foot or two thirds of a metre spherical nest. Humans use mud or bricks to build their homes because the raw materials are all around us. But animal architects learnt to utilise mud long before we did. European house martins gather around patches of moist ground to collect mud to build their nests. Before people were around, martins nested in simple holes built in sandy cliffs. But they soon adapted to exploit our world. Today, martins build their nests under the eaves and roofs of people's homes. Mud is also the preferred building material for a solitary wasp that lives in the African savannah. 
Provided there's enough water, mud is the perfect construction material because it can be moulded into any shape and it dries quickly. The female mud dauber wasp places strips of mud on the outside of her nest. Now the nest is ready to receive her egg. The advantage of mud is that it's porous. Air can enter and the inside gets air conditioning. Capping the cell is the most difficult part of the job, but the wasp makes it look easy. She collects mud in the normal way, but this time makes sure it's extra wet. She then moulds the lid in position. Just as we humans use wood to build with because it's so abundant, marine creatures use the one building material that's very abundant in their world, sand. Low tide on some European beaches exposes structures built by a mysterious creature. The sand mason worm lives in a vertical burrow. The worm uses sand particles to construct a solid structure which both protects it from predators and prevents it from being washed away. To build its burrow, each tentacle must pick up sand just one grain at a time. By speeding up the action, it's possible to see in just a few seconds what the worm achieves in one day. The sandy branching superstructure is held together by glue secreted by the worm. To work underwater, this adhesive would have to be very strong, and such sophisticated building is a remarkable feat for a primitive animal. Animals may be master builders, but some are also expert decorators. Hermit crabs are squatters that take refuge in discarded shells. Once a hermit crab has found a new home, it decorates the shell with a living security system. It recruits stinging anemones. Every time the hermit crab moves house, it also transfers its bodyguards. Meticulously, each anemone is removed from the old and placed on the new home. But like most decorating, it doesn't always go according to plan. Whereas hermit crabs adorn the outside of their homes, some animals are interior decorators. The female leafcutter bee cuts small round sections of leaf to use in her home. She manipulates the pieces by crushing them with her jaws and adding saliva to make them stick together. She then uses the leaves as partitions in which she will place her dozen or so offspring. Using cells to save space is a design tip that inner city architects have only recently employed. But bees have been doing it for 200 million years. Biological studies of bumble and honeybees have found that the most space-efficient shape for a home is a hexagon. That's why bee colonies can raise 50,000 young in a small space. But the most dedicated interior decorators are the birds. Birds go to a lot of trouble to make sure their nests are a safe home for their young and also meet with the approval of their partner. A bird that resides in the rainforests of Australia and Papua New Guinea goes to extraordinary lengths. The male bowerbird meticulously constructs a two-sided nest. His bower can be three foot or one metre high and six foot or two metres wide. He may spend as much as 10 months building and maintaining this construction. 
Male bowerbirds go to this much trouble to impress females. Their plan is to mate with as many as possible. Before showing off his masterpiece, he decorates it with shiny and colourful accessories. Berries and ring cans are used on the inside of the bower, while glass makes the entrance more attractive. Once complete, the male beckons a female to come and look. He hopes to dazzle her, but for now, he must await her judgement. She can tell a lot from his handiwork. This male must have good eyes because he's selected a range of coloured glasses decoration. He probably also has a good mind because he's been creative in his placing of objects and seeds. This indicates to the female he has good genes and is a worthy partner. The female is suitably impressed and the male can hardly contain his excitement. Animals may be skillful builders and creative decorators, but when it comes to inventiveness, surely humans are in a league of their own. Surprisingly not. As a species, we've developed everything from skyscrapers to rockets. And in our homes, we're surrounded with all sorts of gadgets. Take the kitchen, dishwashers, blenders and food processors. For centuries, it was believed that it was this inventiveness that made humans unique. also inventors. Long before we got round to it, animals were using technology. A termite mound is an incredible example of air conditioning. Steel might be strong, but spider silk is five times stronger. And just like us, animals use tools. Many animals are naturally endowed with tools. The woodpecker's beak is such an efficient chisel that over 200 bird species have evolved the woodpecking lifestyle. The European acorn weevil has a giant snout that is effectively a drill. The female weevil burrows into an acorn and then deposits her eggs inside. When the babies hatch, they'll have plenty of food. And speaking of giant snouts, an elephant's trunk is more than just a long nose. It's a combination tool. It's a food gathering implement, a sensitive probe and a weapon all rolled into one. The octopus has eight power tools in the form of its tentacles. On the sea floor, a crab hides in a bottle, believing it will be safe. But the tools of the octopus are highly flexible and can squeeze through remarkably small openings. The tentacles are not just agile, but strong as well. They can even open bottle tops. They're also highly sensitive probes. Just as we use a snorkel to breathe underwater, the red-tailed maggot uses a natural snorkel. 
the red-tailed maggot is the larvae of the drone fly. It's unusual because it can breathe and feed underwater by virtue of a natural snorkel. The maggot can remain underwater because it extends a siphon tube from its tail. Once the siphon hits the top of the water, special hairs open it up and allow air to be sucked down. Then the maggot can feed underwater at its leisure. As long as the maggots stay within periscope depth, they can stay underwater indefinitely, thanks to their unusual tool. If you're not naturally endowed with the right tool, then you have to find one. The Australian buzzard likes to eat large bird eggs, but it doesn't have a strong enough beak to break into the shell. It's learnt to use a stone to do the job. It's a bit of a hit and miss affair, but eventually the buzzard gets its reward. It's been said that the invention of steel was one of the greatest human achievements. For while it's strong, it's also light and flexible. It was about 3,000 years ago that West Africans learnt to smelt iron and develop metallurgy. And today, it's hard to imagine a world without steel. But spiders invented a compound stronger than steel 200 million years before. Weight for weight, spider silk is five times stronger than steel and twice as elastic. The first spiders to manufacture silk were nursery web spiders. The female uses silk to build an egg sac before laying a large ball of eggs into it. She then encloses this in another layer of silk. As the silk dries, it darkens. Once the young spiderlings emerge, the mother builds a silk nursery around them. So for the nursery web spider, protection, not catching prey, is the purpose of silk. But sometimes insects do get caught in the nursery web and biologists believe this provides a clue as to how using webs to catch prey first evolved in the spider family. The earliest known spider to use silk to catch its prey is the sheet web spider. This spider lays a primitive web that is nothing more than a sheet of silk. But it's a very effective trap, as this grasshopper has found out. The spider's venom is so potent that the victim is paralysed within seconds. There's no need for the spider to wrap its prey in silk. As spider webs evolved, they became more complex and the orb web was born. This lace web spider starts building her orb web by laying radial lines from the centre. Next, the spider spins a strengthening ring around the hub to hold the radial framework in position. She then lays down the main spiral from the inside out. There are usually around 30 spiral lines, each designed to snare prey. The spider catches a wasp and wraps it in a stronger variation of silk. Spiders have several different silk glands on their abdomen and each produces a unique type. The wasp tries to sting the spider, but it's all in vain. But what if you could use both silk and glue? Sticky globules produced with the silk and strung out along its length. With this advance, the cone-footed spider doesn't need a sheet or an orb web. 
she can catch her prey with only a series of trip lines. An ant is snared and the spider comes down to claim her prize. From the accidental trap to the sophisticated orb web and sticky trip lines, there's a path of increasing ingenuity in the use of spider silk. But the most remarkable application of silk can be seen in the freshwater spider. This spider builds a dome of silk, fills it with air and attaches it to a pebble at the bottom of a pond. The dome is effectively a diving bell. Just like a scuba diver's oxygen bottles, it allows the spider to breathe underwater. To build the bell, the spider spins a tangle of silk amongst the weed. Next, it traps a bubble of air on waterproof hairs around its abdomen. It then transports this to the diving bell, where it uses its back legs to scrape the bubble off its body. Because spiders breathe through their skin, she must repeat this process until the diving bell has enough air to envelop her whole body. The diving bell isn't just a refuge, it's also a hunting lodge. All the energy used in the kill uses up the spider's air supply. She must return to her diving bell to breathe. In effect, the bell is a primitive submarine and it was invented 200 million years before humans ventured underwater in a craft. Animals may be great builders and inventors, but can they compete with us when it comes to complex practices such as agriculture? For most of the time we humans have lived on Earth, we've been hunter-gatherers. It was in the Middle East around 8000 BC that we first learnt to cultivate crops. Then in 4000 BC, Asians started domesticating animals. The practice spread across Europe and eventually the world. One of the main reasons for the success of the human race is that we've learnt to cultivate plants and domesticate animals. But this is a recent event. We've been on this planet for two million years, yet it was only 10,000 years ago that we harvested our first crops. By contrast, farming was going on 100 million years earlier in primitive animals with tiny brains. Meet the world's first farmers, ants. In South America, a procession of leafcutter ants are on a mission. These female workers move out from the colony in such high numbers that they wear down the vegetation. With their sharp jaws, the ants cut thousands of leaves into manageable pieces. But rather than eat them, they carry them back to their nest. The leaf pieces may be many times bigger than the carrier, but ants can lift ten times their own weight. The ants transport the leaves into an underground nest chamber that can be one metre or three feet wide. The ants can't digest the leaves, but fungi can. So leafcutter ants have learned to cultivate fungi en masse. The worker ants chew the leaves and mix it with their saliva to start breaking down the tough cellulose. Then the fungi do the rest. They decompose the leaves into sugars, which the ants can digest. So, just like humans, Leafcutter ants have learned agricultural skills. They've come up with a highly intelligent solution to a food shortage problem. Oak acorns are rich in protein and fat and are highly sought after by many birds and mammals. Over the last 30 million years, squirrels have formed such a strong relationship with oak trees 
that they've co-evolved to shape each other's destiny. Squirrels love acorns. By selecting the nuts for size, taste and nutritional value, squirrels have domesticated acorns in the same way that humans have altered the evolution of cows and sheep. Acorns, like many plant seeds, are designed to be carried away from the parent tree by an animal. Although many get eaten, enough acorns fall to the ground or are cached by the squirrel and forgotten. Squirrels started eating acorns in such high numbers that over time, oaks adapted to produce an abundant supply with thin shells, so the squirrels could crack them open. So the squirrel gets a convenient, easy to open meal, and in return, the tree has a friend to transport and bury its seeds. The result is that millions of generations of squirrels have shaped the evolution of billions of acorns by selecting the ones that appeal to them most. Australian weaver ants have gone one step further. They have domesticated an animal. The ants look after a caterpillar because it secretes honeydew. It's a win-win scenario. The ants get a meal and the caterpillar gains protection. One North American solitary wasp even uses caterpillars as slaves. During the breeding season, the female sand wasp builds a simple nest hole in the ground. Once the hole is complete, the female hides it from neighbours by covering it with a stone. She then sets off to find food. She finds a caterpillar, but a rival also wants it. A tug of war ensues. During these skirmishes, two rules are observed. The wasps never sting each other, and the caterpillar is never damaged. Once she has claimed it as her own, the female wasp stings it behind the head. Not to kill it, but to paralyze it. She then takes it back to her nest and buries it alive. She abducts several more caterpillars and each meets the same fate. In the burrow, the wasp lays an egg and surrounds it with as many as 10 enslaved caterpillars. Why so many? So when the wasp egg hatches, the larva will have plenty of fresh food. The final closure of the hole is different from the temporary lid the wasp uses when she goes hunting. This time she vibrates tiny stones into place until the hole is securely sealed. She departs to die, knowing that her young are well catered for. We humans are a successful species not just because of our building and farming skills, but because of our ability to engineer. This has allowed us to generate power, build cities and manipulate our environment. Insects too are engineers. Many ant species, like these Australian bulldog ants, excavate underground chambers and change their environment in order to accommodate colonies of up to half a million individuals. But the supreme insect engineer is the termite. Their mounds can reach as high as 15 feet or five meters. Relative to their size, termites build skyscrapers that are 20 times higher than our tallest buildings. Termite mounds are actually ventilation towers. Because a colony may contain over one million individuals, the termites generate lots of heat. The workers build air conditioning stacks that are marvels of engineering. The mound allows stale warm air to leave through the top 
and draws in fresh, cool air through a series of underground chambers and veins. To make them more efficient, the shape and orientation of these northern Australian mounds means that early and late in the day, a large surface area faces the sun to maximise warming. But at midday, when the danger is overheating, only the knife edge across the top catches the sun. Humans have built machines to more effectively exploit land, water and air. But it was only 100 years ago that we built our first planes. Animals have had a head start. 250 million years ago, beetles mastered powered flight. Hoverflies were outmaneuvering any aircraft we've ever dreamt up and dragonflies were more versatile than even our most sophisticated helicopter. They can hover, fly forward, sideways or backward. Birds are also aerial acrobats. Birds of prey are expert gliders. Hummingbirds can hover by moving their wings at 100 beats per second. The true magnificence of being able to fly with a flexible wing beat can only be seen with the action slowed down 100 times. We humans build cities so that everything we require is easily accessible. Over the last 1,000 years, we've created an amazing infrastructure of trade and transport that allows millions of people to live together. But we're not the only species thriving in mass communities. There are many other animals that also live in vast colonies. Some are so complex that only now are we starting to understand them. Australia's Great Barrier Reef is the only living organism visible from space. Yet the whole structure was built entirely by tiny coral polyps. So the simplest of animals can be architects on the grandest of scales. Coral larvae feed on plankton, but also host algae so they can produce energy from sunlight. Over the last 17 million years, some 400 species of corals have built an underwater metropolis that stretches over 1,200 miles or 2,000 kilometres, an area the size of Britain. And it's still growing, adding 5,000 tonnes or 5 million kilograms of new buildings every year. The Great Barrier Reef rivals a human city in every aspect. It's home to over 10,000 animal species and trillions of individuals. It's one of the most diverse habitats on the planet. Wasp and bee communities also rival the sophistication of our cities. There are over 20,000 species of wasp and bee thriving in the world today. 250 million years ago, wasps and bees were all primitive, solitary hunters. But some evolved to build one of the most efficient animal societies the world has ever seen. Bumblebee colonies consist mainly of workers that are all daughters of the Queen. The workers build cells for their eggs out of wax secreted from glands on the Queen's abdomen. With the Queen devoted solely to laying eggs and the workers to raising young and collecting food, the society can grow quicker than if there was no division of labour. The colony organisation is similar to that of human society, 
but with one major difference. Bumblebees lack the technology to store food, so the colony can't survive through winter when food is scarce. In autumn, the colony ceases to exist. The males die and the pregnant females hibernate. Come next spring, a new colony will have to be built from scratch. Honeybees triumph because they can store food and survive through winter. They've evolved the technology to turn pollen and nectar into honey. Bee colonies divide by swarming. When a new queen hatches, she leaves the hive with a band of workers and sets off to found a new nest. A breakaway swarm of this kind can have as many as 20,000 individuals. Nowadays, honeybees have been domesticated and live in hives, prepared for the convenience of their human exploiters. Once a new home is found, the female workers build hexagonal cells in which to place their young. The sole purpose of the queen is to lay eggs, so she's surrounded at all times by couriers and workers. Once they hatch, the eggs are tended and fed, and the workers maintain a constant supply of honey for the newborns. Honeybees have another advantage over primitive bees, the technology to communicate. Biologists have found that honeybees use scent and dance to convey 37 different messages that govern behaviour. The queen's reign may last as much as six years, and in the course of it, she may produce as many as 100,000 new bees. A healthy hive contains about 50,000 bees. In every way, a honeybee colony mirrors a human city. Bees communicate and trade. They have a health, welfare, education and transport system. We humans tend to adjust the environment to suit ourselves. And animals are masters at adapting to any change that we make. Birds, such as seagulls and terns, have broadened their diet to include our crop seeds. Insects have also rapidly adapted to living alongside humans, despite the fact that we're a relative newcomer on Earth. The key to their adaptability is innovation. Fifty-five percent of all living creatures are insects, and it's their sheer numbers that put many on a collision course with humans. 250 million maggots can be born from just two adult flies. Many of these survive and hatch into flies. And a few invade our homes, our very sweet homes. We wage war with the fly, but it's a war we can never win because we're hopelessly outnumbered. We've invented every kind of insect trap imaginable, but they hardly make a dent in the population. For every insect we kill, it's estimated that a further 20 million individuals survive. Insects don't just invade our space, they attack our houses, clothes and crops. In the USA alone, 
Termites cause $2 billion worth of damage every year, more than most other natural disasters put together. Half of all the world's insects are beetles. In North America, the Colorado beetle can destroy whole potato crops in a matter of days. Time-lapse photography shows the damage a heavy infestation can do. The beetles eat the leaves and stems until there's nothing left. The grain weevil can demolish entire silos of wheat, rice and corn, causing billions of dollars worth of damage each year. What they don't eat, they contaminate with their droppings. Little wonder we rage war against the insect. We bombard them with so many pesticides that more money is spent each year trying to eradicate insects than on all human wars combined. But not all the animals we coexist with become our enemies. In fact, many birds, such as barn owls, play a vital role in pest control by preying on animals that we consider vermin. Barn owls have soft plumage that permits relatively silent flight, giving the prey no warning of the bird's approach. Because they have adapted so well to farmland, today barn owls are common right across Britain. For many other birds, man's prolific building activities have opened up new avenues to exploit. In Istanbul, mosques are home to several stork species. While in Britain, one bird has adapted to the urban lifestyle with great success. The kestrel is Britain's most common bird of prey. The construction of motorways and grass verges along the sides of roads has inadvertently created a large area of habitat that isn't treated with pesticides and fertilisers. Hovering is the perfect way to search motorway verges, giving it plenty of time to spot mice, worms or insects. Another reason for the kestrel's success is the availability of nesting sites in farmhouses. Today, kestrels are also numerous in urban areas due to the abundant food found in city streets and parks. Their ability to adapt and abundance of food and good nesting sites are the reasons why kestrels have adapted so well to city living. We live in a world with animals that are as innovative as we are, but our species is a powerful one. The human population doubles every 41 years. Many animals have become victims of the extent to which we modify the environment. We consume 40% of the Earth's net productivity and no other animal has the capacity to destroy the planet at such a rapid rate. We should remember that we get a lot of enjoyment from and also need other animals. It's in our interest to protect them. Animals were inventing buildings, air conditioning, roads, bridges and farms long before we appeared on the scene. We too have invented millions of objects and built great cities like this one. As we go about our daily lives, it's worth remembering we share this world with other animals. Creatures that are also smart innovative and inventive and deserving of our respect for no matter what we have achieved animals did it first